everybody and welcome to Anchor Online. My name is Sam. My name is Isaac. And it is so great to have you with us this morning. Absolutely. Now, if this is your first time joining us at Anchor Online or even just joining us at Anchor in general, we are really, really glad that you're here. Yes. And you've joined us on a really good Sunday. Yeah. We're starting a new series called Deconstructing God. I'm and so excited it's going to be about a good this one. series. Sam, Sam will tell you a little bit more about it, uh, about it in a second. Now, if you are new and you want to connect with us a little bit more, you can go ahead and click the Connect With Us link fill out the form there. You can also just send us a DM on Facebook or Instagram. Yeah. Uh, the handle on Instagram is at Anchor Church and you can search Anchor Church Sydney on Facebook. Send us a DM there and one of our team will get in touch with you. Yeah, and if you're new or even if you're not new and you're in a GC and you're plugged into our church, um, one of the ways that you can formally uh, call Anchor Home, I guess, is by doing a course that we have called Growth Track. It's a really great course where over four sessions, um, you just get to hear the story of Anchor Anchor's heart, what we're all about, and then at the end of it, you can make a formal commitment to join Anchor and be part of the fan fam, which we would love. <laughs> um, as Isaac said, we've got a new series coming up today called Deconstructing God. Um, phenomenal series, some really great speakers coming up. Mm. And it, yeah, just touches on the really um, big wrestles that we could have in the Christian faith with um, big questions. So we're going to be hitting some big topics, um, stuff like how do we reconcile a loving God with suffering? Um, what's God's design for sexuality? How do we manage doubts as a Christian? How does a loving God send people to hell? Um, big ones. Violence <laughs> in the Old Testament. So there's just really um, big questions. And I think so often um, in our faith, we can kind of come up with all those questions in our head. And when we don't get answers for them, um, we kind of just debunk the whole Christian faith and go, oh, well, it all must be a lie. But I think the reality is that a lot of research has been done on this. A lot of these questions have already been brought up and answered and so we've got some great speakers um, to just speak into all of that um, and encourage us and so I think whether you're not a Christian and you're at the very beginning of your faith um, this is going to be a super helpful series to just hear about some of those really big things in the Christian faith um, and if you're a Christian I just think it's going to be really relevant and really helpful um, as we're just thinking through those really big questions. Yeah. Now, obviously, um, we're still living in a time where COVID is still a real reality in our world. We've just seen that this week with mm. what's happening in Victoria. We're praying really hard that this uh, we don't see that same reality here in New South Wales. But um, we know nonetheless that people still have needs within this time and that this time isn't easy for a lot of people, even yeah. as restrictions lift. So if you have uh, needs and need assistance in any way, we want to help you out. If you head to Anchor Church, .com.au forward slash online. There is a form at the bottom there um, if you need assistance to fill out. And one of our team uh, can be in touch and work out how we can fill your needs. Now we've got an Alpha course coming up as well. Yes, can July 28th. July 28th. Can you tell us a little bit about what Alpha is about? Sure. So Alpha um, is a course kind of similar to what this series is. It's about the really big questions of life, nav navigating your faith, um, an introduction to who Jesus is. And so... If you are interested in that and you're interested in exploring all of that, it's a really safe space to be able to do that um, with a small group of people. It's going to be happening on Zoom. Um, so, yeah, if you've never heard about Alpha, it's an awesome course. I encourage you to check it out. Um, yeah. And invite someone. if you, Yes. And, and join in yourself as well, even if you think you have all those questions answered for yourself. Yeah, and if you're part of our church family, just remember to be praying um, for your five friends. We've asked you to pray for five friends in the lead up to Alpha. Um, be inviting. I know it can be really hard sometimes to invite people because of fear of rejection, um, but just go for it. I think it's a really valuable course um, and we've seen that worldwide, the things that Alpha has done for people in their lives. So speaking of Alpha, we're going to throw to a video now and then we've got Alex Stark coming up for his sermon. Every day we ask so many questions. What should I wear? What's the weather going to be like? How am I going to fit everything in? But then there are those bigger questions, like why am I here? Where am I heading? Is there more to life than this? I 
I had arrived at an answer to the most important issue that we humans ever deal with, is there a God? And I had arrived there without ever really looking at the evidence. And I was supposed to be a scientist. At 28, uh, I had gotten many of the things that I thought I wanted. You know, my girlfriend was on the cover of magazines, I had a Beamer, and I was so unhappy. It was a realization maybe that I would, I would never find happiness where I was looking for it. I think for so many years, you know, I always just strived to be strong in myself. All I needed was me and my buddies and, you know, would be like invincible. But the truth is, none of us are. And I found purpose, I found meaning, I found hope. God took something so broken and made it a beautiful art piece. Alpha is a place where you can be yourself. You can say what you think and challenge everything. No, no question is too complex or too simple. And what your point of view is, is as important as anyone else's. We are going on a journey together, an adventure to explore the questions of life, faith, and meaning. Well, good morning. Uh, thanks for joining us here for Church Online. Uh, my name's Alex. I'm a member of both of this church, but also too of Camperdown Gospel Community. And it's a real privilege just to be streaming live into your lounge room this Sunday morning. Uh, it's also a real joy and honor to kick off a series that this church is conducting called Deconstructing God. And the inspiration for this series is really birthed out of our cultural moment. See, we live in what people have called a secular age. And a secular age is one in which people are really suspicious about claims towards God and religion and spirituality and the supernatural. Now, don't get me wrong. People still want to find meaning in this world and they'll find meaning any way that they can, whether in the coffee that they buy or the sustainable clothes that they wear. But the idea that God exists, people are sus on it. It's a secular age. No one's done a reality check on the claim. Also, the story goes. Many of you tuning in will be aware, if you're Christians, um, that there's been a number of sort of famous and passionate public Christians come out recently who have deconverted. And in the last few years, a number of them have renounced their faith. Um, I don't want to go into their stories too much because um, behind the stories lay a person. And much of what gets reported on the Twitter sphere and the opinionocracy of our online world um, isn't perfectly faithful to the experience that they go through. So I don't want to cheapen their stories, but I want to pull out one scarlet thread that runs through each of the stories that I myself have read about. And it's this, that each single person who walked away from God, whether they're a public Christian who's renounced their faith online or whether someone um, private who you've never really heard of, each person has struggled with doubt. And the truth is, if you're human, this could be your experience. See, regardless of your background, we all doubt. Maybe you're a Christian wrestling with particular aspects of your faith. Maybe you're a Christian who feels like you're at the end of your faith. Maybe you're not a Christian and you're interested in Christianity, but there's all these intellectual objections, which is just obstacles for you to overcome. You've got doubts. And the whole point of this series is to create a space in which Christians can be honest about their doubts, and a space also in which we can invite non-Christians to bring their questions and ask it of the church, of Jesus, and of the Christian story itself. This, this series, Deconstructing God, is your license. It's your license to ask away. See, I, myself, I'm sick of hearing all of these stories of people who've walked away from following Jesus just because they say, man, I just had all these questions, but I didn't feel comfortable asking them. 
Or they say things like, man, I had all these doubts, but no one would help me wrestle through them. I just don't think that's a story we need to keep rehearsing. There's another option. And the option is that we just talk about these things. So today, I'm not gonna talk about particular questions, specific objections that people have. I'm gonna go a bit more meta. I wanna take a bird's eye view uh, of, of the topic on the nature of doubt. Because my contention is that unless you have a healthy understanding of the nature of doubt, you will not know what to do when it comes. And so to unpack that a bit, I wanna move through two major scenes with you. The first scene is this. Um, I wanna debunk some of the myths that we unhelpfully believe about doubt. Now this part will be a bit more heavier, so kind of buckle up and, and join me for that. Um, but the second thing I wanna do is I wanna give us a manual to guide us through our doubts. And that's gonna be really practical, so feel free to get your notepad out. Um, and in the meantime, grab your Bibles out because they're gonna be jumping around a bit uh, and follow along. But um, why don't I pray and we'll kick things off. <sighs> Father, thank you so much that you, you invite us to come to you with our doubts and our objections and our faith and our boldness and our timidity. You invite us to come. Thank you, Lord, that you've revealed yourself in history, through your word, in your church, and by your spirit. We ask, Lord, that today you'd speak to us through your word, in your story, and that you, by your spirit, would witness to the things that are said, turn our hearts more towards Jesus, clarify our thinking. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So first, the myths that we believe about doubt. The first myth that we believe about doubt is that the doubt that we're experiencing is something unique to us. Um, that the doubt that you're going through is something that you alone are experiencing. Maybe you say it like this, like, oh man, nobody else seems to be going through this thing like I am. Or maybe you say something like, ah, I bet nobody has thought about this particular objection before. There might have been times where you genuinely feel like you've discovered the one secret that Christianity has been trying to hide for the last two millennia. But here's the thing, you're not alone. And you probably haven't discovered the dirty little secret that Christianity has been trying to hide. There are none. Christianity is as public and as historic as any Christian faith, as any faith, sorry, gets. You're in, and so when you doubt, you're in good company. Um, the church has a pretty healthy tradition of doubters. Um, there are tons of examples of believers in God doubting, even in the, the Bible that we hold dear. Um, think about David, the, the writer of the larger portion of the Psalms. And if you're not familiar with the Psalms, they're sort of like the ancient Israelite hymn book. Um, and Psalm 88 has been hailed by commentators as one of the most dark, um, sort of uh, distant Psalms written by David. It's one of the only few Psalms in the hymn book itself, which doesn't finish by David on a note of prayer. And right in the middle, David pens these words. Let me, let me read them to you, starting in verse 13. He says, I cry to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. Why, Lord, do you reject me and hide your face from me? Here, he feels abandoned. Like God, even if he is real, is distant and disinterested. Or let's just say, you know, the king of kings of the Old Testament Israelite people, it's not good enough example for you. So let's just upgrade that one a little bit. Um, Jesus, try this one on for size. The greatest human who ever lived, who, by the way, the New Testament argues was God in the flesh. Yeah, he doubted. Um, toward the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus is hanging on the cross. It's his final hours um, and he's facing death. Darkness covers the land and he feels alone and he cries out in desperation these words he says my god my god why have you forsaken me i'm sure you might have prayed that prayer in your own life and if you've not prayed the prayer you've at least felt the reality of it um, that you're in such agony and the presence and the goodness of god just feels like a fantasy not real well, think about church history, move past the bible and go to the church that um, sort of makes up in history what we are today um, some of the great Christian thinkers of the ages themselves have felt doubt. Let me mention one, uh, one of my favorite writers, C.S. Lewis. Um, Lewis, he was the author of the Chronicles of Narnia, but some of his best work was actually done in essays um, used as defense of the Christian faith. And in 1940, Lewis published a book and the book was called A Problem or The Problem of Pain. 
And this book was sort of like a detached rationalistic argument for the goodness of God in the face of suffering. Um, it was less this heartfelt doubt. It was more just like a philosophical argument. But in 1960, after Lewis lost his wife, Joy, he reflected on it in another book. And the book's called A Grief Observed. And in it, Lewis goes from this detached, even though he doesn't really write that way, but he goes from this detached philosophical armchair arguer and now enters into the space where he's laying bare his heart as he tries to follow God in a world full of pain. And he pens these words. He says, meanwhile, where is God? When you are happy, so happy that you have no sense of needing him, so happy that you attempted to feel his claims upon you as an interruption, if you remember yourself and turn to him with gratitude and praise, you will be, or so it feels, welcomed with open arms. But go to him when your need is desperate, when all other help is in vain. And what do you find? A door slammed in your face and a sound of bolting and double bolting on the inside. After that, silence. You may as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence will become. There are no lights in the windows. What's he saying? He's saying that when you're going something that's circumstantially debilitating, it can be really hard to trust God. You don't feel him. You don't see him. He may as well not be there. If you think you're alone in your doubts, you're wrong. The Christian church has a great tradition of healthy doubt. You're in good company. Welcome. Join us at the table. If you're experiencing doubts, you're not alone. You haven't found the one secret that's going to debunk the Christian story. There's been too much good thought done up until this point. And you're not alone in your particular experience of doubt. Welcome. The second myth that we believe about doubt is that doubt either has to be something that's like wholly good or wholly evil, but it can't be anything in between. What do I mean? Well, in the modern Christian world, there's actually competing ideas uh, for what doubt really signifies in the Christian life. And you've got to kind of follow me here. Um, on the one hand, there's this Christian subculture that defines faith in such a way as to make doubt problematic. What do I mean? Well, you'll know that you've experienced this kind of subculture when you've been shaped to think that faith means something like wish fulfillment, something like blind, naive hope in a bunch of fantastical ideas. Don't believe in miracles? Just have faith. Uh, don't know about sort of the way by which the New Testament came together? Just trust it. If you're doubting, stop. Just have faith. Uh, if you have questions, stop it. Just believe. It's like, if you remember that song from George Michael, um, you might have heard somebody say something like this to you. You just got to have faith. Um, faith in this sort of subculture, it actually becomes like this emotional switch, which if you have it, you can turn it on. But if you don't, you can't. Um, and if you have the ability to turn this switch on, good for you. You've got faith. But if you don't, shame. On the other hand, there's another Christian subculture, which is actually really reacting heavily against this former Christian subculture. Um, in the last decade, there's been a multiplication of online magazines, podcasts, YouTube channels that feature Christians who are deconstructing their faith from the ground up. And in some ways, hear this, this is mostly an American phenomenon, but it does trickle down to the Australian imagination. Um, and, and hear this part, this is somewhat of a good thing. Um, in some way, what they advocate is good because a lot of the ideas that they're deconstructing are themselves bad, unhelpful, unbiblical expressions of Christian faith. At the same time, it does run the risk of throwing the Christian baby out with the sub-Christian bathwater. Faith in this movement is something continually up for question and doubt. So here's the divide. Think about this. Here's the divide right now in modern Christian culture on the topic of doubt. Either doubt is wholly wrong and should be rejected and ignored, or doubt is wholly good and should be embraced uh, and used as a catalyst to rethink everything in your world. The Bible has a way more nuanced picture of what doubt means in the Christian life than that. There's a famous story in, uh, in Mark 9. It's actually one of my favorite stories. Uh, it's, a it's a story about a father who's got a sick son. And the father takes his son to Jesus' disciples who pray for the son, but the healing fails. 
So the father then takes the son to Jesus, rats out the disciples for their failed attempts, and basically says, Jesus, why won't the evil spirit come out of my son? And Jesus, Jesus says these words. He says, everything is possible for him who believes. Okay. The father of the sick son responds with the most astonishing words. He says this, verse 24, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Boom. Jesus heals the son and then debriefs the situation with the disciples. Strange story, what's going on? Well, I won't pretend to unpack the entire passage, but one thing is definitely worth picking up on here. There's a man whose circumstances take him to Jesus' followers. His encounter there infuses him with doubt. Maybe my son won't get healed. Maybe I've got no reason to believe that God's really powerful. Jesus sets up the criteria for a miracle, belief, and the father fulfills it, not by pretending that he had unwavering certainty and optimism in God, but by being honest that he didn't. In other words, the father takes his whole self, doubts and all, and gives them to Jesus. Do you see that? What's the takeaway? It's this, that being a Christian doesn't mean being somebody who doesn't have doubts. It means being somebody who's honest about their doubts and brings them to God in community. That's real faith. Trusting God with who you are and with who you're not. With all your boldness and all your timidity. With all your faith and all your doubt. See, the problem with a Christian subculture, which defines faith as wish fulfillment, is that it makes the focus of your Christian journey one in which you're concerned to have strong faith. So you try and convince yourself that you don't really doubt or that you really just believe. And if you can't convince yourself of that, you just go through the, through the motions. Either way, it's exhausting and it actually end up harming you and your journey. The problem with an overreaction to this Christian subculture is that you can mistake the good life of following Jesus for the second best life of getting lost in your own subjective thought world. So you don't just deconstruct bad ideas about God, you end up deconstructing everything. And that's just as potentially damaging, especially if you go it alone. Here's the good news of the Christian life, that it's not the strength of your faith that counts. It's the object of your faith, which means even a weak faith grasps the same Jesus. Doubt is not inherently wrong, so don't hide it or be ashamed of it. Nor is doubt inherently good, so don't uncritically embrace it. What you need is to be able to navigate it. What you need is a manual. What you need is wisdom. What you need is a community. And so we're going to unpack those two things now. So a manual to get us through doubts. Um, so how do we do that? Three things. One, we need to articulate our doubts. Two, we need to unmask our beliefs. And three, we need to follow the evidence. So first, we need to articulate our doubts. Now, this is crucial. Um, so often, in my personal experience too, doubt can be more of a feeling than it is like an intellectual argument that you've stumbled across. Um, you might wake up one day thinking, man, I just don't know if I believe this anymore and I don't know why I feel that way. Um, this has happened to me before and it's really disorientating. Um, it's not like you were up late uh, on Reddit, on some kind of thread, following comments back and forth, or it's not like you fell down the black hole of atheist versus Christian YouTube. It's just a feeling. And to be honest, it's really horrible. Um, it's what some writers have called the dark night of the soul. God feels absent, so maybe he was never there. What do you do when that happens? Well, I would suggest that you just articulate what your doubt is. I said before that real faith means trusting God with who you are and who you're not taking both your faith and your doubt. How do you do that? Well, first, you do it in prayer. Um, yeah, you can pray through your doubts. Did you know that? You can bring them to God in prayer. That's what the psalmist is doing. He's saying, God, why have you hidden your face from me? On top of that, you can take your doubts to God's people. Write it down, tell a trusted friend, invite a mentor into your life to be a soundboard for the thoughts that you've got or don't have. Um, why? Well, because if what's causing you to doubt isn't actually an intellectual argument about Christianity, but is more of this like ominous cloud-like feeling, then you've actually got no substantive reason to doubt. And realizing that is going to be so helpful. Um, because it's not really an intellectual argument that's challenged your thinking. Now, let's say you do write it down. 
And it's actually a really specific intellectual doubt about Christianity. Maybe it's something like this, like, how do I trust that the resurrection really happened? Or how do I make sense of science in the Bible? Um, what happens then? Well, when you write it down or you tell someone about it or you bring it to God in prayer, it turns the ominous cloud-like feeling into a manageable, researchable question. You can't answer a non-asked question, but you can research an articulated doubt. Truth invites questioning. So when you're doubting, just articulate it. Bring it to God in prayer. Be honest about it in the community of God's people. Here's the point. We need to articulate our doubts, not just feel our doubts. And the best place to do that, in my personal experience, is in prayer and in community. Second, we need to unmask our beliefs. What do I mean? Well, many people think that doubt is one thing and belief is another. That Christians are people of faith and everybody else are just people of reason. Um, but that's not true. Uh, all doubts are fundamentally just deeper beliefs. Every time you say that you doubt Christianity, you're making a leap of faith in something else, which itself is often more difficult to justify than the belief that you're questioning. So, for example, one of the biggest critiques of Christianity, one of the great objections that people have against it is this, it's exclusivity. It's very exclusive for Christians to say that Jesus is the only way. And so many people re might react and say something like this. Well, there just can't be any uh, one true way to God. Maybe all ways are just as valid. But if you say that, here's what you're really saying deep down underneath that doubt. You're saying that what you believe is that all truth is relative. And what reasons there are there to believe that? Well, the only way to know that all truth is relative is if you have comprehensive, complete, universal understanding of the entire universe and its mechanistic workings. Do you? Do you have that kind of access to objective truth? Do you have a God's eye view on the matter? No, no one does. It's a leap of faith. And if I were to ask you, what sort of things do you think we can be certain about in life? What sort of things can we prove? What would you say? The truth is you actually can't say too much. This really shocked me when I looked into it, but there's probably three categories of things in life that you can say with absolute certainty that you can prove. Um, one of them is mathematical truths. So five plus five always equals five. You can't argue about that. You can prove that. Another one is the laws of logic. A does not equal B. Straightforward. And the third one is self-evident truth. So if I say something like all bachelors are unmarried men, it's self-evidently true that that's the case. All of these statements are self-evidently true and can be proven simply by stating them. But other claims are different. Every other truth claim is made not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of probability. In fact, almost every meaningful thing in life is a matter of belief on the basis of probability. There's a British poet, his name was Alfred Tennyson, and he put it like this, he said, for nothing worthy proving can be proven, nor yet disprove wherefore thou be wise, cleave ever to the sunnier side of doubt. Let me put it this way. Historically speaking, we can't prove that America gained its independence in 1776, but it makes the most sense given the evidence we have. Scientifically speaking, you can't prove that the sun's gonna rise tomorrow, but it makes a lot of sense to believe that. It's rational to believe that on the evidence that we have, on the repeatability of what we've observed. And philosophically speaking, we can't prove or disprove that God exists. So here's the point. All of us, therefore, whether Christian, atheist, Buddhist, agnostic, apathetic, none, all of us are people of faith. Every single one of us. We're all believers. And so the question is not so much whether you believe, but what do you believe? And what evidence do you have to support the claim? This should really humble us, actually. We're finite and we do not have a God's eye view of the universe. Stop pretending like we're not all people of faith. We are, every single one of us. Paul, the apostle, he'd put it like this to the Corinthians in his first letter. He'd say, for now we see only in a mirror, dimly, but then we'll see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know even as I've fully been known. If you have doubts about Christianity, 
Make sure you unmask the beliefs that lie underneath those doubts. See, you may discover that many of the doubts that you have about Christianity, they might be based on beliefs that you need to justify, or that you can't justify, or that you've never really thought about. I'm not saying that is the case, I'm just saying it might be, and it should make you more open to Christianity. In the 20th century, there was a student at the University of Oxford named Sheldon Van Auken. He was an English lit major, and uh, he and his wife were originally from America. And early in their marriage, they spent their time sailing around Florida, uh, listening to vinyl and writing poetry for one another. And they were these self-proclaimed pagan, beauty-loving agnostics. And when they moved to England, England uh, they became friends with C.S. Lewis and a number of Christians in Oxford. And the more time they spent with believers, the more they entertained the idea of becoming Christians themselves. Eventually, Davy, Sheldon's wife, uh, she gave in and became a Christian. But for him, it took a bit more time. He couldn't get past his doubts. And in a book that he wrote called A Severe Mercy, he records his experience. Listen to these words as he's describing what it looks like for him to come face to face with the, with the truth of the Christian story. He says, Christianity, in a word, the divinity of Jesus, seemed probable to me. But there is a gap between the probable and the proved. And how was I to cross it? I don't know if you've ever felt that in your life. You can't prove God. What do you do about it? That's a great question. How do you cross that gap? Well, two pages later, in the same book, he describes in a poem what helped him cross it. Let me read to you the poem. He writes this. He said, Did Jesus live and did he really say the burning words that banish mortal fear? And are they true? Just this is central here. The church must stand or fall. It's Christ we weigh. Between the probable and the proved, there yawns a gap. Afraid to jump, we stand absurd. Then, then see behind us sink the ground and worse, our very standpoint crumbling. Desperate dawns. What's he saying? He's saying that when you are considering the truth of the Christian story, you need to be honest that you yourself are already a person of faith. And the moment you do that, you may well realize like he did, that the ground on which you stand in your belief against Christianity may be more brittle than the ground available to you in Christianity. Between the probable and the proved, there yawns a gap. Afraid to jump, we stand absurd. Then see behind us, sink the ground and worse, our very standpoint crumbling. Unmask your doubts. What do you believe? This brings me to the last point. You need to follow the evidence. One of the famous stories from the Gospel of John is the story of Thomas, the disciple, in chapter 20, um, who's a disciple who spent three years on the road with Jesus. Jesus dies, and then the hope that he was the Messiah who would liberate God's people dies with him. And all of the disciples had their hopes come to nothing. But then, a few days later, the resurrected Jesus appears to the disciples. Thomas is out at the time, and so he thinks that when he gets back to meet his mates that they've just gone mad uh, when they give him this report. He's like, dead bodies, they don't rise from the dead. You don't need to be a modern person to think that. And consequently, Thomas earned his nickname. He was dubbed Doubting Thomas. He said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails are, I will not believe. A week later, the resurrected Jesus appears to the disciples. He goes up to Thomas and notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, just have faith. He doesn't say, because you have doubted, you're out. He actually says, put your fingers here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. In other words, Jesus condescended to Thomas's need for evidence. And we can learn something from this, I think. That he's done the same thing for us already in history. See, God created us with minds and he's not upset when we want to use them. And Christianity presents itself as a public and historic faith which is open to historical inquiry and therefore verification. One historian, John Dixon, Sydney's own, he put it like this. He said, Christianity lays its head on the chopping block of history and asks anybody who's game 
and is genuinely interested in Jesus to come and take a swing. Christianity, Christianity is not just a private revelation that happened for a handful of people. It's not just a secret experience of a select few. It's God himself writing himself into history, flesh and blood, to make himself known. And that means you can investigate it. You can look into the evidence. God wasn't making a mistake when he stepped into history. So look into the evidence. If you want to do that, over Easter, um, the lead pastor, Matt, uh, actually gave a sermon outlining the evidence that exists for the resurrection of Jesus. So if you go onto YouTube, uh, type in Anchor Church Sydney and look for, I think it's around April 12th, um, a, a sermon that's called, Is the Resurrection Believable? Uh, you can start to entertain some of that stuff for yourself. Um, but notice, come back to the passage with me. Notice though, what happens next? Jesus says to Thomas, stop doubting and believe. It's fascinating. See, on the one hand, Jesus condescends to Thomas's skepticism and he says, here, observe, I really am the crucified and resurrected Messiah. I am who I said I was. Then in the same breath, Jesus challenges Thomas's skepticism. He says, now step into this story unashamedly. You have seen, you have heard, you've believed, join me. In absolute confidence, not looking back, stop doubting and believe. Here's the point. God does not reject your doubts, but nor will he perpetually let you live subject to them. He offers you evidence and invites you to investigate, but he refuses to be the tame object of your inquiry for too long. He's the Lord of the world and the God of the cosmos, and that's gotta mean something. It means God is inviting you to investigate his claims, but he will also persuade you to investigate your own heart in the process. And when God does that, he's no longer the object of your inquiry. You become the object of his. See, God is not interested in being the idea that you simply doubt or entertain at a safe distance. He's interested in being your Lord, your savior, your king. He wants relationship with you. That's what this is all for. Thomas's response was, my Lord and my God. And so the question for you is, what's your response? I never actually finished reading the poem from Van Alken before. It actually comes in a chapter from his autobiography called Encounters with Light. And the whole poem reads like this. Did Jesus live and did he really say the burning words that banish mortal fear? And are they true? Just this is central here. The church must stand or fall, it's Christ we weigh. All else is off the point, the flood, the day of Eden or the virgin birth have done. The question is, did God send us the Son, incarnate crying love, love is the way. Between the probable and the proved there yawns a gap, afraid to jump, we stand absurd. Then see behind us sink the ground and worse, our very standpoint crumbling, desperate dawns. Our only hope to leap into the word that opens up the shuttered universe. We believe two myths about doubt that are really unhelpful. The first is that if you're a doubter, you're alone. The good news is that's not true. The second myth is that doubt is either wholly good or wholly evil, but that just forces us to hide our doubts or let our doubts be the catalyst to deconstruct everything. The good news is that doubt actually is just a mundane phenomenon which we need to navigate with wisdom. The Christian story, it licenses you to be honest about your doubts and bring them to God in community. It also asks you to uncover your beliefs, which may be the things that hold you back from considering Christianity seriously. Finally, Jesus invites you to investigate the evidence, but the question always remains, are you open to where it leads? I'm going to pray now to close out our service. Would you join me? Yeah, dear Lord, we just want to uh, thank you for the message we just heard from Alex. We thank you that you've given us brains that uh, independently think and question. Mm. Um, and we just pray, Lord, that as we question and, and we have doubts that arise throughout our faith, that you would continue to help us explore them in community. Um, and Lord, that we would be open about them and vocalize them um, and know that we're not alone um, in those in those doubts, Lord. Mm. Um, yeah, we just want to thank you right now for the community we have around us. We thank you for Anchor Church. 
And we thank you for the blessing it is to still meet together on a Sunday under your word, um, no matter what the restrictions are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, well, you might have noticed that we're straight up after the sermon. So we have no worship um, in our service this morning. So if you are lucky enough to have musicians in your um, church at home setting, um, then I imagine a lot of you have been doing some live worship. If you don't, there's resources on our YouTube. So just Anchor Church Sydney on YouTube. And there's a bunch of songs up there that you can um, yeah, enjoy now and spend some time worshiping. Yeah. Now, just a reminder that Alpha is coming up on July 28th, starting online. And so if you are interested in joining Alpha or you want to invite someone along, you can head to anchorchurch.com.au forward slash Alpha for more information or send us a DM, connect with us link, whatever you want there, and we can get some more information to you. Yep. We hope you have a really great week and we will see you back here for another another week. We've mm. got Jeff Jones Jeff coming Jones, up. Yep. And you know, it's funny when we... um. When we filmed Jeff doing his sermon, after it I was like, oh, what, what was the title of your talk? And he goes, oh, I've changed it. It's called Bridesmaids from Hell. Is that right? Should be interesting. So it should be an interesting <laughs> week. So come back here next week to hear the talk titled Bridesmaids from Hell. <laughs> we'll see you guys later. Bye.